Thank you for having us here. My name is Steve Lyons. I'm originally from Houston. Uh, I'm kind of the law enforcement influence on the, the group. I spent 35 years with the Houston Police Department. Uh, started there uh, looking for a job uh, with the idea that I was going to work there for a little while to make a support a, a new wife and then get a college degree and then go and then go get a real job. Uh, 35 years later, I retired from the police department. Uh, to give you a little background, uh, uh, I, I have a son who's mentally ill, and I'll get into that, give you some stories about him. Uh, but you, I look at where you are now and getting into as far as working with people who, are, who have mental illness and, and the way you will deal with them compared to when I started with the police department in 1970. And it's, it's, it's ironic that after about my first year on the street, I was uh, rotated. We had mandatory rotations into the jail. So I spent about a year working in the jail. And I look at the way both on the street and in the jail that we dealt with people with mental illness, and it was, it was appalling. There's no other way to describe it. It was appalling. It was a, I, I'm ashamed of the way we did it, but it's the only thing we knew is what we were taught. Fortunately, we finally have become a little more aware of the needs of these individuals and what we should be doing, the way we should be treating them with compassion and care, which we haven't done in the past. And in this jail, it's not been done well in the past. Uh, and I know because I had a son in here, my, my mentally ill son here, and, uh, and every time I'd come to visit him, uh, he would be beat up. And, and I, 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 let me say right up front, I never thought any of the jailers were involved in this. His behavior was so outrageous at the time that fellow inmates would attack him and hit him because every time I come in, he'd have a new cut, new bruise, new, uh, you know, black eye, whatever. And talking to him, I realized his behavior greatly contributed to that happening to him. And he always said it was other, other inmates. We have, we have come in Houston, they have made great strides, and I'm proud they, they, they finally came forward and, and did. But unfortunately, a lot of them were driven for the, for the wrong reason. Now, a lot of officers, and I remember I was one of them, and a lot of the others that I worked with, wanted to do something different, but we couldn't. I mean, you might individually, and that's still a huge part, you might individually be compassionate and caring, and I think because you're in the area you're in, that's part of the reason you're there. But it's still the system didn't let you do what you should be doing to take care of these individuals. What drove a lot of the change in Houston is over a short period of time, I think it was the 1980s, late 80s, is that uh, we ended up having confrontations with people with mental illness on multiple occasions, but on three separate occasions over a period of about two months. And we shot and killed three mentally ill people. And even with that, it didn't, it didn't make the top decide we need to do this differently, even though the officers were crying for it. So it was pushed from the bottom to the large extent. But after the multi-million dollar lawsuit settlements, uh, then the top realized, we can't afford to keep paying money out like this. Maybe we need to do something a little different. Whether it was for the right reasons or not, it still helped bring around change. And they formed uh, the crisis intervention teams and crisis intervention unit. And now, it, it, I, I'm quite proud of what they've done. I wish they had done it when I was there, is they actually formed a mental health unit inside the police department where they, they train officers out of, out of uh, 5,500 officers in Houston, 2,800 have crisis intervention training. They respond to, I was appalled when I saw this number, 36,000 crisis intervention calls a year. That's 100 a day. Of course, Houston's a big city, but I mean, that's a hundred a day that they deal with uh, that would not have been dealt with in the past. I keep thinking a hundred times a day, they now have somebody who's trained to interact with, with people with mental illness versus no training at all. So it, it, it's it moved light years ahead. And, and you're, you're kind of here in this jail, I and mean, I know you, if you read the paper, you see the lawsuits they're dealing with right now that the, that's going on right now, which was negligence. And I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not the jury, but, you know, you can read between the lines. Uh, whether they uh, win or lose either side, it was not handled well. And I think everybody concedes that. 
My son is paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, this was a nice young man. Uh, high school did well. Uh, went off to the Marines. The day he graduated from high school, he went off to the Marine Reserves, came back, was in the Marines, big proud Marine, big six foot three, strong fella. Uh, went to college, got a degree in hotel and restaurant management, went to work, and then literally fell off the face of the planet, diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic, hearing voices, seeing things. That was about almost 22, 23 years ago now. It has been a 22 year journey through hell. There's no other way to describe it. Uh, and I say sometimes for me, but his hell is a lot worse. Now this is a young man since I bought up to Tulsa about three or four years ago. Uh, in the first two years ago here, he was kicked out of six residential care facilities, and there are no residential care facilities in Tulsa at all. You have to put them out somewhere and then go visit them. Sometimes an hour or two hour drive to visit. He was kicked out of six extended stay motels, uh, he was banned from the Salvation Army uh, next door. He was banned from the, the Day Center. John 316, Denver House. Uh, he was in a, a sort of community treatment program. They kicked him out, and, and their response to him was the best thing that could happen to your son would be for him to go to prison. And I also got the same, yeah, I got the same uh, statement from somebody with the community, uh, the uh, Tulsa Mental Health Association. Uh, after talking to him and seeing what the deal is that the best thing can happen for your son unfortunately is wanting to go to prison uh, and, and that's, that's, that's a, uh, terrible but unfortunately it's true and I understand although it's terrible that they say that it's true with what we deal with right now with the way we hint, ha handle people with mental illness the doctors have said my son even on medication which he is very medically compliant and I know because he gets a shot every two weeks, and I take him to get the shot. So I know he's getting his antipsychotic. But even on medication, he does not do well. And has has been hospitalized. I've lost count. It's somewhere in 100 to 120 times over the last 22 years. So it's, it's a bad situation. As far as the way he's been dealt with by law enforcement or the way law enforcement has handled him, I'm going to give you two, two scenarios. Uh, one, I was, uh, this was in Houston the first time, uh, was in Houston, and uh, I was actually in Austin, and he was living at my house at the time, which I later had to make him leave because uh, my daughter was living there, and uh, we locked our bedroom doors at night, and uh, when the morning I woke up and there's a knife stuck in the door of my bedroom, I realized it's, it's better I not have him here. Uh, and like I say, he, he's a big guy and, and my daughter's tiny. But in the first situation, I was in Austin in one of the hats I wore, I dealt with the legislature for the police department, is I get a call from my neighbor and he says, Steve, we've got a problem here. <clears throat> Bill, what's going on? He said, well, Dustin's out in the driveway and he's got a knife and saying he has to kill somebody. Uh, Bill, go into your house, lock the door and call 911. The constables show up. I wish the sheriff's department would show up. They're better trained. The constables show up. And my neighbor doesn't want to file charges. You know, he, he knows Dustin's situation. He does not want to file charges. And so the deputy tells me, well, there's nothing we can do. That uh, he doesn't want to file charges. We can't, we can't take him into custody. And I said, y yes, he's mentally ill. He's shown himself to be a danger to somebody else. He needs to be carried down to in, in, in Texas Seminole. He, they could take him to any hospital. That'd have to be a psychiatric unit for immediate evaluation, and they could transfer him to a psychiatric facility. And the doctor said, no, we can't transport him. Call your supervisor. Supervisor comes over and tells me the same thing. And I said, no, that's not the law. That's not the way it's done. And you're going to leave him there with my neighbor and the neighbors around, a young man who's had a knife saying he has to kill somebody. <laughs> I'm thinking, there's some insanity going on here and it's not just my son. Uh, <laughs> but, so finally a na another neighbor comes over, uh, a, a good neighbor who's formerly in the army, big old guy, and uh, he gets on the phone with me and he goes, well, you know, he can't stay here. He said, I'll, I'll uh, take him down to the hospital. I said, you, you can't transport him, he's dangerous. Oh, I, I, 
finally what happened is the deputies agreed they would go to the hospital to do the paperwork if the neighbor would transport him down there. So they in their police car followed him down there with my son in the front seat, seat belted in. I, I mean, just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's your reaction saying it's just kind of, uh, the second incident, so it was handled horribly. The second incident was uh, Dust was living up here and we were going down to Houston. And we stopped uh, a family event down there and he was, he, fairly, you know, relaxed, and I decided to try and take him down. He wanted to go. Stop at a convenience store somewhere. I, I'm getting gas. He goes to the convenience store. Five minutes later, I noticed a police car pull up in front, uh, sideways in front of the convenience store. And I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I instantly think, oh, God, I know who's involved in this. I just, you know, it's, so I walk up, and, and uh, the officer walks out, my son walks out, and, and they're standing facing each other a couple feet apart. And I know not to walk up too close to the officer because, you know, he doesn't know who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I walk up and I stand back, you know, 10 feet or so. I said, officer, I'm his dad. He's mentally ill. If I can help you in any way, let me know. Okay, sir, just wait just a minute. But he's standing there talking to my son, and, uh, to, and I couldn't hear all the conversation. The next thing I know, my son reaches out and pushes the officer. Now, I know 1970 errors, what would have happened immediately. There is no doubt in my mind, he would have been down on the ground. I mean, that's just, it's, it's just the way it was done. Uh, this officer <coughs> calmly stepped back and said, God, what's that, son, uh, you can't be pushing me, uh, so let, we've got something to take care of here, so don't be putting your hands on me, okay? Uh, pushes him again. Now, <laughs> I was just, I mean, I was just agape that he didn't take him down at that point. This officer continued to try and to de-escalate the situation and says, says, now son, you wouldn't like it if I started pushing you, would you? No. Well then, okay, let's have an agreement right now. We won't push each other. I, I won't push you and you don't push me. Okay. And he finally, he de-escalated the situation and, 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 and got the situation re resolved inside. And, you know, I told him about my son, said I would take him back to Tulsa, I wasn't going down to Houston, and released him to me. Uh, and what a difference. In fact, I ended up writing the chief of that uh, city a letter committing the officer, but what a difference in the way he was handled. It's just, it's just night and day difference of the de-escalation uh, by being calm and having a demeanor that's not so threatening to the individual. Now, something that's that's really my son is strange is to give you a little insight into the way they think and what you might be dealing with. My son had a habit of walking down the street, well, right next door here, in fact, uh, and hitting people at the day center. He'd walk up and hit people. Walking down, he'd walk up and hit people. And so got in trouble a couple times for that. And so I'm having conversations with him about, why are you hitting people? Well, Dad, you know why I'm hitting people. No, don't tell me. Well, I know that if I don't hit them, these people are going to be in a black hole for all eternity. So he thinks he's doing something good. And that's his mindset. And I'm telling him, no, I, I understand where you're coming from and what you're thinking, but that's not correct. And you can't be hitting people because you're going to get hit back. You're going to get in trouble. You're going to end up in jail. Somebody's going to do something really bad to you. And so I tell him this. Oh, okay, Dad, I understand. The next day, same thing. He's hitting people. And I'm trying to say, Dustin, I told you not to hit people. Well, after a lengthy conversation with him, what I find out is he, he, he heard me for the five minutes I'm telling him not to hit people, to not hit people. The next 16 hours he's awake, he's hearing a voice telling him to hit people, and the voice is my voice. So what's he gonna do? What's he gonna, he's gonna pay attention to me five minutes telling him not to do something versus 16 hours telling him he needs to do something. But the, I think trying to give you a little idea why some of these individuals 
act the way they do and what's driving them uh, and, and why they, what is totally irrational to us is perfectly logical. In fact, you know, they think they're doing a good thing sometimes. So it gives you a, an idea. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize today is your safety. <coughs> because that's one thing I, when I would go into roll call as a supervisor, I would tell, I want everybody to come back at the end of the shift and go home at the end of their shift, whether it be early in the morning or late at night or whatever. Uh, so be safe, protect each other, back each other up. My son's a big guy. He's not particularly heavy, he's pretty thin now, but he's, but he's tall and, and still fairly strong. I, was, I had taken him to family services to get his shot, took him home, and he was in kind of a somber mood. And he sat out on the couch, I, he, he lives, I bought a little house for him, it was the only place where I keep him off the street. Uh, he was living homeless downtown for a while. Uh, bought a little house for him. And he's sitting on the couch and I'm standing up and just, I mean, it was like sitting on a spring almost. He came up over the top of the coffee table and hit me in the side of the face, probably as hard as I've ever been hit in my life. I mean, I saw stars. And, and, you know, kind of backed off and, and I mean, weak need. And next thing I know, he's around my neck with his arm choking me. And, and I'm trying to get my hands out. I mean, it was, it was not, it was violent. There's no other way to describe it. We were all over the room, knocking furniture over, knocking holes in the wall. And uh, I can't shake him. And finally, I ended up on the ground with him on top of me. I'm starting to, my vision is starting to go from lack of oxygen. I just, I, I can, it's just like I can sit here, it's like I'm still there. I remember thinking, I am not going, I spent 35 years with the Houston Police Department, shot at several times, gun stuck to me, you know, hair still stands up on the back of my head thinking about some situation. And I'm thinking, I am not going to die on the floor of this house if it's hands of my son today. And I am convinced there was some divine intervention that day. Because I just, absolute, last ditch, desperate effort, forced myself up, stood him up and ran him into a wall, broke the wall, and knocked him loose and was able to get out of the house. So what I emphasize here is, if is your safety. Now, to put it in perspective, the best thing to deal with people with mental illness is compassion. And I'm trying to convince you, what I'm trying to convince you is the compassion and the officer's safety are, are one and the same. Because if you're compassionate and understanding with these individuals, their likelihood of being dangerous and threatening to you is greatly diminished. So if you can't do it for the compassion, do it for the training of an officer of just your safety. You know, the compassion would be the best way to go, but if you can't, do it for your own safety. If you treat them with a little respect and all kindness and de-escalate, uh, you know, you're a lot safer than you will be if you're the hard-nosed, in-their-face uh, detention officer. So just trying to get you to, 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 to Look at it from the compassion, but nothing, your own self-protection to be able to go home at the end of each shift. But, you know, it's, I, I commend you. I, I, the fact that you're in the mental health unit is just, uh, uh, you know, you, to be your, we go uh, speak to nurses sometimes. Uh, and and it's, it's kind of, you know, there's certain groups of people we go talk to, and nurses are one of them. And I just have mental health unit are in that same category. They yeah. really are. And I just commend you for being there. So I've got 500 miles to drive, so I'm going to stop. And if y'all have some questions you want to ask before I leave, and, and they'll be here for the whole time. I really appreciate your time and really commend what you're doing. Questions? I just wish you good luck dealing with them. I know it's going to be hard. But I wish you luck dealing with your Thank son. You. Thank you. It's, you know, it's, it's just, it's heartbreaking. I recently going through some pictures at the 
house here in Tulsa. I'm here in Tulsa. I married a woman here in Tulsa, and she says I have to live here. So I'm not used to it anymore. <laughs> Funny about that. I don't understand. But, but I was going through some pictures of my son, and, and this, you know, cute, beautiful little blonde-haired child was, and, and I, I mean, I look at him, and there's just a grieving process that I still go through when I look at those pictures. I, I can't hang them. Uh, there's some bunch of them in frame. I, I can't hang them in the wall. I, I cannot bear to look and think of, of, of the lost. My late wife passed away 23 years ago, and she was ill for a, 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 about a year and died of cancer. That one year was a nightmare, but it was a cakewalk compared to dealing with my son for 23 years. And yet, as hard as it is for me to deal with as a parent, it's a lot worse for him. He's lost everything. He's lost everything. He'll never be able to work. He'll never have a normal relationship. Uh, he lives a lot of times. He's paranoid a lot of times. He's real fearful at times. He can be violent. So he's lost so much more uh, than, than I have. So understand that if you deal with any of the, 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 the parents or relatives too, sometimes what they're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. I, I, I'm glad to be here. Glad we, I'm glad you have us in to, to talk to you. We really, we really appreciate you having us come in. Thank you, Steve.